Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the Seven Bridges Killer. It's a tale of loss and forgotten dreams. If you are triggered by anything dealing with death and or rape, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out my gaming channel, Retail Me Games, for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. Named from the Rocky Mounds at the end of the Tar River, Rocky Mount, North Carolina made its debut on March 22, 1816. In the small town of currently 57,477, it birthed the first post office and one of the first cotton mills in North Carolina. I've never had the pleasure of visiting the town, but from what I gathered from different websites, much like any town, there's a good side of Rocky Mount and a bad. There's beauty in the town with its building structures and aquatic escapes. But there's also a darkness that encompasses the freshly painted bricks of homes and growing woods, and it's been festering for over 10 years. According to an article in GQ, Rocky Mount was listed as one of the 10 most impoverished cities in America, with the economical decline and aftermath of Hurricane Floyd in September 1999 ruining homes and jobs for the predominantly black town. Over time, drugs began to flood the streets, much like Floyd once had and black women were vanishing from their homes without an indicator of their whereabouts. That is, until the first body was found. Born October 25, 1975, not a lot is known about 29-year-old Melanie Lachey Wiggins, aside from her drug usage and prostitution background. She did have a son, Joshua, who was raised by his grandmother. Wiggins was found in the woods near Nobles Mill Pond Road on May 30, 2005, after being reported missing by her boyfriend June 2nd of the same year. According to an autopsy, she died from blunt force trauma to the head and suffered stab wounds. When she was found, she was partially clothed and already in a state of decomposition. Three years after her body was found, Joshua, Melanie's 11-year-old son, would be killed by a tornado. Two years after Melanie is found, another body is discovered. In a pile of trash behind a house, the new, badly decomposed body of 35-year-old Jackie Nikila Nikki Thorpe rests. Her head and arms had been detached from her body. Her body was in such a state when found that it was difficult to determine the cause of death. Nikki had been a cheerleader in high school, though she grew up playing football with the boys in her neighborhood. She enjoyed writing poetry and spending evenings at the O64 Bingo Parlor. Her talent didn't stop at words. She was also gifted in cosmetology, training a new hairdo, specifically braids, for crack. But Nikki was trying to go straight. Her boyfriend was now in prison, and she pledged to try out the community college. She'd never get that chance. Nikki was reported missing May 8, 2007, and found three months later, the first body on Seven Bridges Road. The second body along Seven Bridges Road was mistaken for a riding deer by a farmer on March 13, 2008. He smelled the corpse prior to seeing it as he took down his electric fence. Wearing only underwear, the body of 50-year-old Ernestine Battle was discovered with her hands raised above her skull face down. Much like Nikki, Ernestine's cause of death was difficult to determine because of the state of decomposition. Though police thought she may have been strangled, despite her throat bone being absent thanks to stray animals. At some point in her life, Ernestine once worked for the cable company and pried herself on her hair, makeup, and clothes. Unclear events led Ernestine to become a prostitute, selling her body to support a crack habit that prevented her from taking care of her two children. Along with her nightly routine, she obtained a criminal record over the course of nine years for drugs and prostitution. Though her lifestyle prevented her from normalcy, she still kept in touch with her family, and when she hadn't spoken to them for some time, they began to worry. They reported her missing February 2, 2008, but couldn't imagine finding their daughter, sister, friend in her state. Unlike Ernestine, the next victim seemed to be without a history or a family. 33-year-old Elizabeth Jane Smallwood was found February 13, 2009 along Melton Drive by a prison cleanup crew beside a soccer field. She hadn't been reported missing. In fact, her body remained unidentified for eight months until her strange father was called. The medical examiner stated that Smallwood may have been dead for a year, maybe longer. Nikki Thorpe's mother asked how Smallwood could remain missing for so long. 
She used to hang around on the street with my daughter. If I ever approached my daughter, the other woman usually would walk away, either out of courtesy or maybe out of shame. I don't know. Like the other women, Smallwood achieved a lengthy criminal record, including charges of prostitution, assault, drug possession, larceny, and resisting arrest. Her last known residency had no record of her on the paperwork, and neighbors, though familiar with her by appearance, didn't actually know her. Smallwood was given a funeral by the community in October 2009. Next to be found was 28-year-old Tahara Shanice Nicholson on March 7, 2009. Unlike the others, her body was in good condition. She was partially clothed, wearing only a black bra and white socks. Abrasions covered her body, similar to those associated with being dragged, and she had a neck fracture. Two weeks to her discovery, Nicholson complained that she was tired of walking the streets and that she was going to get cleaned for her son, Jamarius. She attended rehab, but it didn't last long. Her mother warned her the son was attacking and taking women, but Nicholson made it a point to not get into cars with those she didn't know. Therefore, Tahara Nicholson knew her killer. The next body to be found in 2009 was 31-year-old Jernice Sunshine Hargrove. She was discovered by a tobacco laborer on June 29th in a wooded area off of Seven Bridges Road. She had been there for approximately two months. Along with her skeletal remains were half a dozen of her teeth that had been beaten from her skull and a broken chocolate brown painted toenail. Her cause of death hadn't been determined, but it was thought to be strangulation. Sunshine called herself that because of her love of bright colors, which she showcased with bright hair of yellow or blue. She was often in fights with neighborhood girls, but she was strong in all senses of the word. She was bipolar and had only an 8th grade education, but she loved to rap and often wrote verse upon verses which she performed at the Diamond Club. The night she disappeared, she visited her family limping on a broken foot. She was reported missing a week later. With the amount of women missing and reappearing, the community, specifically the black community of Rocky Mount, were growing frustrated that the police didn't seem interested in helping. A candlelight vigil was held in Martin Luther King Jr. Park following the discovery of Sunshine, and Mayor David Combs not only had no idea about the vigil, he didn't know the extent to the crimes at hand. In a June 2000 interview with Raleigh News, Combs said that he learned about the seriousness of the murders by July or August, and that he read about the memorials via the newspaper. At this point, six women had now been found dead, while three remained missing. There were Christine Boone, Joyce Durham, and Yolanda Snap Lancaster. 28-year-old nursing student Stephanie Jones founded Missing or Murdered Sisters, Moms, to help raise money to publicize the killings and search for those still missing. Moms is going to be an advocate for all missing persons, regardless of race or social class. Anyone who needs help, anybody who isn't receiving the attention they need, we're going to advocate for them and raise awareness about the case. Vivian Lord, chairwoman of the Criminal Justice Department at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and Dr. Michael Teague, a forensic psychologist, pieced together a profile of the assumed killer. Together they concluded it was the act of one person, who believed he was cleansing the world of prostitutes or deliberately picking those he thought wouldn't be missed. Stephanie's foundation helped to post billboards with the faces of the missing and slain women. Police Chief John mainly stated, they need to stay on law enforcement. You have to stay on us. Let us know that you're not going away until you know we've done everything we possibly could do. Because if you don't care, said the chief, I don't know why we should. With the pressure mounting to catch a killer, the police finally declared September 1, 2009 they'd made an arrest in the Seven Bridges case. Born July 15, 1978, Antoine Maurice Pittman was raised by his single teen mother, Gloria, north of Rocky Mount in Battleboro. He was learning disabled and later dropped out of ninth grade. Not long after dropping out of high school, Pittman was arrested and charged with attempted rape of a two-year-old. As part of a plea deal, he was convicted of a lesser charge of indecent liberties with a child and sentenced to spend time in the state's impact probation program, a 90-day military-style boot camp for young offenders. After a month in the program, he was kicked out for reportedly trying to start fights. He was then placed under house arrest with his mother, where he served his probation. His later convictions included assault, larceny, trespassing, and resisting police. His years afterwards consisted of small-town jobs, such as magazine salesman, tobacco warehouse worker, and chicken processing plant laborer. He was later arrested in 2007 for soliciting a prostitute in Rocky Mount, though the charges were later dropped. 
On the day of Sunshine Hargrove's disappearance, Pittman was found asleep in his 1996 Pontiac Bowenville alongside 7 Bridges Road, a few yards from where Sunshine's body would later be discovered. The trooper who located Pittman observed that his boots were caked with dirt and that his fly was unzipped. He was then booked for a DUI and his license was revoked. He was still in jail for these charges as well as driving without an operator's license and failing to register as a sex offender when the charges of first degree murder were put forth. September 2nd, the trial began. DNA found on Tahara Nicholson's body landed Pittman charged for her murder. Police began to piece together connections between Pittman and the murdered women, such as the fact that he knew Ernestine Battle, the second woman found along Seven Bridges, but there had yet to be any charges added to Pittman's indictment of Nicholson's murder. As the trial continued, Pittman admitted to having sex with Nicholson at a motel on March 1, 2009, but that he dropped her off behind the Rocky Mount Library and never saw her again. On Nicholson's panties and shirt, forensic analysis couldn't find any evidence of Pittman, but rather of an unknown person. The male DNA profile from Antoine Pittman was not detected in this mixture, SBI forensic DNA analysis Kirsten Hughes said. Still, the community was split on the guilt of Pittman. Some believed he was innocent, saying that he kept to himself and was just a quiet guy, while others looked at his long criminal history as a sign of a murderer in the making. Authorities continued their case, getting a warrant to search Pittman's home. Inside, they found a box containing one large shoe, bullets, and miscellaneous paper items, a small shoe box with one bullet and one rubber glove, and a paper bag containing one woman's red halter top and a trash bag by his bed. On Pittman's computer, they found history of rape websites, such as Rape Galaxy and Rape in HD. The following days, women began to take the stand, declaring their time with Pittman. Former prostitute Lakeisha Worsley said he strangled her. Another testified that he attacked her in the woods. In late 2009, the trial concluded and Antoine Pittman was found guilty of first-degree murder of Tahara Nicholson. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Pittman continues to claim his innocence. As Pittman sits in a prison cell and authorities continue to pin their many murders on him, more bodies begin to surface. 43-year-old Christine Boone was found in the woods, 37 miles northeast of Rocky Mount, near a trailer that Pittman once lived on March 12, 2010. Her body was in an advanced state of decomposition. She'd come from a religious family of 10. Christine leaves behind three children and seven grandchildren. Fifteen days later, a man riding a four-wheeler through a wooded area came across a skeleton that was later identified as 40-year-old Roberta Williams. Roberta used to work at the taxi station as a cleaner, and at some point turned her life over to prostitution. She was said to be HIV positive. Williams was never reported missing because she was believed to be homeless. A year later, in January 2011, the remains of 36-year-old Yolanda Snap Lancaster were discovered in a wooded area. Snap was described as intelligent and had dreams of enlisting in the armed services. When the recruiters told her to lose weight, she took to the streets instead. She got herself a criminal record, a boyfriend, and a home without electricity or water. On April 6, 2010, Governor Bev Perdue dispatched the NC National Guard to search Seven Bridges Road and elsewhere around Rocky Mount, but their efforts turned up nothing. Joyce Renee Durham, last seen on June 17, 2007, is still missing as of April 2018. Though they believe she may be the victim of Antoine Pittman, there isn't any evidence to pinpoint this for sure. She was 46 at the time of her disappearance, 5'2", approximately 118 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. She was described as a fun person with a great sense of humor. Denise Williams is often credited as the first body and victim of the Seven Bridges Road murders, but her family states this isn't true. Denise's bloated corpse was found by a fisherman floating face down in Koki Swamp in 2003. She was good with computers and earned her GED at Edgecombe Community College. She had two children, a seven-year-old daughter and an eight-month-old son. She sold drugs, mostly ecstasy or molly, but she wasn't a prostitute like the other victims. Her autopsy reported that she'd overdosed on ecstasy, but her cause of death was drowning. When she'd been placed into the water, she was still alive. Anyone with information about Joyce Durham or Denise Williams can call Twin County Crime Stoppers at 252-977-1111. A cash reward is offered for both. 
Currently, in 2018, Antoine Putman has only been charged with the murder of Tahara Nicholson, and because of little media attention, it's hard to say whether the murders along Seven Bridges Road has truly stopped. After the arrest of Pittman, Mayor David Combs said, I don't want everybody in town just to focus on the murders, because life has to go on, and the town has to go on, and we got a lot of great things here. And I don't want everybody that thinks about Rocky Mount to think that, well, that's where those murders occurred. I love being from North Carolina. It's the only home I've ever known. But that doesn't mean I support or enjoy everything that happens here. I'm Mrs. True Crime, and remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about the Seven Bridges Road murders, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Tuesday and Friday, and you don't want to miss what's in store.